Welcome to Trans Fabulous. My name is Sasha Sidek, and I am the co-founder of Trans Sisters United and Trans Pride March Melbourne. I'm also that familiar voice at Clearing the Air at 3CR Radio. And I'm also um, the board member at Trans Fem to End Violence Against Trans Women. And today I have a very special guest. Her name is Julie Peters. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge that this event and all the work that we undertake as a crew happens on a stolen land. We wish to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation are the traditional custodian of this land now we call Melbourne. We pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We also would like to extend our respect to our trans elders past and present. Julie Peters is still naive enough to believe the world can be a better place and has been activist in trying to make it happen as a doctoral researcher, teacher, performer, writer, practical environmentalist, media professional. A strong focus of her work over three decades has been to promote social justice and equality for trans and gender diverse individuals with the public, health professionals, and across intersectional academic discourses. Welcome, Julie Peters. Thank you. It's been an honor to, um, to have you on this show and even to know you uh, because we, we did a book together. That's how yeah. I, I met you and was like, oh my God, your, um, your resume, <laughs> your bio is amazing. I really need to get to know uh, who Julie Peters is. Oh, thank you. And um, today I think uh, we, uh, it's about trans fabulous as you are. Let's start with who Julie Peters is. Part of my, my search during life was an identity quest, particularly in my teens and 20s. I was desperate to figure out, was I, was I transsexual? Was I a transvestite? Was I mm. cross-dressful? Was I gay? Was Because oh, uh, a lot of people suggested you know, there's no such thing as trans. What it was was you know, that, that trans women are gay men who are homophobic and don't, so don't want to be seen as yeah. gay. But, I, but, you know, that wasn't me either. Mm -hmm. So eventually, it took me ages to work this out, I realised I am my journey. I've, I am what I've done. Mm. So, you know, I'm the Julie Peters gender. <laughs> so um, at what age did you realise that um, you are transgender? I, I wouldn't say I realised I was transgender at first. As maybe a three-year-old, I just thought my parents were really dumb okay. for not realising I was a girl. Yeah. Why, why do they keep cutting my hair and buy me boys' clothes? Right. That's, so I, that was the... So, yeah, that was a far more naive version mm -mm, of it. Mm -mm. But I would say three, if, 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 if that's... Okay. Yeah. Like, you know, at that time, there's no internet. There's no manual book, uh, how to be a transgender person. I, I know. And when I asked my mum, why, why was I a boy? She, she said, she said well, because God made you a boy. She was too embarrassed to talk about body bits. Yeah. I took me, I took it. It was one of my neighbours, you know, Peter down the street, who told me that, you know, boys had penises and girls didn't. I went, oh, I didn't know that. Because my mother was too embarrassed to tell me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I still remember because I transitioned at uh, mid-90s. So I also disco discovered that I liked to wear women's outfit when I was a kid. Um, I didn't know the word transsexual or transgender at that oh, time. No, no, no. no, So I didn't know. I just liked being feminine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Same, yeah. same. I yeah. agree. Yeah. And also, it was it hard um, for you to transition at that time? Oh, well, it was impossible in the 1950s, although um, in the early 1960s, w when I got to the same height as my mum, I, I realised I could fit into her, to her clothes. <laughs> and so, um, because I, and then I started sneaking out at night. That was quite, it turns out to be quite dangerous because what I did is I waited till my parents went to bed. So I didn't go out until like 11 or 12 o'clock at night. Right. And so this is me as an 11 year old walking around the streets of Port On Mel your own? On my own, Oh, yeah. my goodness. See, okay. And, and, uh, and uh, oh, I found guys were trying to get me into their cars <gasps> and the police followed me one night and I got really scared. Yeah. Um, but what stopped me, then I went, oh, I've got to work out how to do this at daytime. But, um, but I never did because what happened, well, not, not at that time, not in the 1960s, mm -mm. what happened was puberty happened and all of a sudden I became very hairy. Yeah. And so I couldn't, I, I, I could no longer pass as, as a girl. Yeah. So I, I got, became very depressed because of that. And did you get to meet other transgender people at that time? I didn't really get well, to meet transgender people until about um, 1975. Okay. Because, remember, this is still 25 years before 
before the internet. Yeah. And and so I had to wait till I found a, a, an article in a magazine. So Clio had an, an article and it mentioned the Seahorse Club. Mm. Um, and then Forum also had an article which mentioned the Seahorse Club. So the Seahorse Club at that time advertised itself. This is in the early in the early to mid 70s as yeah. as a club for heterosexual transvestites. Right. They would not call themselves that now. That's the first time I, I met trans people. Talking about Seahorse as well is uh, is an organization is still going mm. um till today. I believe you also was involved or maybe a founder or uh, one of the founder of Transgender Victoria. I think it was about two thousand. The the earlier gay and lesbian rights lobby had fallen over, mm-hmm. and I got involved in the committee of a, of the new gay and lesbian rights lobby, which is still going. Um, and but I was trying to. I wanted it to be the gay and lesbian and trans rights lobby. Yeah. But at the public meeting that set it up, uh, basically that was voted down. So I just stood up at the meeting and said, well, we're going to form our own, we're going to form a transgender <laughs> rights lobby. And and then, you know, um, Kayleen White and Sally Goldner ran with it mm-hmm. and, and and, and they tried a couple of different versions, and they, we, we, I think we initially called it the Transgender Rights Lobby, but, but it gradually evolved into Transgender Victoria. Do you still remember which year Transgender Victoria actually really? The short answer is no. I was convener in 2001, and, okay. and Kayleen and uh, Sally were co-conveners the year before. Okay. And, and they were, during that year, they were negotiating with the Victorian government um, to, to get um, trans included under equal Oppi- under okay. the Equal Opportunity Act, and they were reason- they were successful too. But yeah. I think that's uh, that's why at the end of two thousand two thousand one, I think yeah. it was, they they were feeling burnt out because they uh, put so much work of into course. it. And that's when I took over for a year to t- just have a bit of a, a, a yeah a rest. But, <laughs> but we couldn't get co-conveners. We we're supposed to have two uh, yeah. conveners, yeah. Uh, so I did it by myself for a year. It was an interesting year, um, and, and we always had pizza, went for pizza afterwards, which yeah. was nice. <laughs> and um, did a lot of other trans people reach out to Transgender Victoria? A, a lot were. I mean, some, no. some were still going, I mean, a lot were still going to Seahorse. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and Seahorse in those days, mostly for people who were part-time, mm. um, because you know, they still had like straight jobs and, and didn't feel that they could transition. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Transgender Victoria w- was where a lot of, trans people met other trans people who had transitioned and in fact you know during that year I was convener we had an interesting situation where a few of the members probably actually it was close to half the members yeah um, because it turned out in those days there wasn't like a committee and transgender Victoria just every mm-hmm. every member came to the committee meetings yeah um, because that's the way we ran it because there were so it wasn't such a big organization in those yeah. days and um, about half the members uh, because because of the um, you know, the negativity around mm. being trans or transsexual, they wanted mm. to change the name from Transgender Victoria. They wanted to say, um, um, we, don't, we don't want to have a name like Transgender Victoria because everybody will know we're trans. And at that time, also, a lot of transgender people do not want to be known as trans. Oh, no, yeah, no. Yeah. Particularly in, um, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, it, you know, the, the, the belief was that unless you could pass really mm. well, mm. you would have a, a horrible life. Yeah. Um, you had to pass... As a woman, mm. and, and you had to then uh, disappear into society in your yeah. new gender. Yeah. But um, you know, as you can see, I haven't quite done that. I, I've, I've <laughs> popping out again. And going, Hi, I'm here. I'm here, and I'm trans. When did you actually feel comfortable of coming out? I did it gradually, in a way. So yeah. I'm going to jump a decade or two here. When I trans, I transitioned in 1990 mm-hmm. because I'd, I'd been working at technique I suppose you know, yeah like makeup hair yeah 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 uh, all that sort of things <laughs> at, but and mostly going to parties so yeah. even work parties I would I was a boy at, wo- at work okay. and then at, at a party I would go out looking I'd go out looking very glamorous yeah, yeah um and and I, I we can't got a bit of a reputation for that yeah and then 1990 I just felt no no this is this is me I really have to do it mm. but but I also felt that it was 1990 if I hadn't done it before 1990, I probably would have been really bullied and pressured to leave. Yeah. But by doing it after 1990, or 1990 and later, um, I, I was able to stay in the same job and mm. just con- you know, continue. I think that was the main thing. So, I then, so what that meant was I came out to 700 people at work. And then a few years later, like in the early 90s, 94-ish, when 
there was a lot of anti-trans stuff happening in the gay press. Mm -mm. I started to write in the gay press. Mm -mm. So I, I would guess I came out to 20,000 people yeah. In, the, in the early 90s. Yeah. And then in 95, 96, I ran for parliament mm -mm. for the House of Representatives for the Democrats. Yeah. And and I, I then tried, then I went, when I was on this television show, I was in the Herald Sun, I did this, I did this, I did this. I worked out, I came out to three million people. Wow. <laughs> I went, oh, wow. Yeah. And I went, oh, well, I've survived. <laughs> so I think by coming out to 700, 10,000, three million, by doing it in steps, yeah. it was made it easier yeah yeah of course yeah. and speaking about work you uh, worked at abc for five decades five decades yes yeah. <laughs> I, I know. It, seems ridiculous. <laughs> it seems ridiculous but when i say it but i, but I, I cannot remember I, and i've got photos from all those decades i've you, seen that photos yeah, yeah, yeah. So, when, me. so when i started the abc television was still black and white how did you get into um abc oh well i was a university dropout at that time okay <laughs> yeah uh, because when I first went to university, I, um, I, it was probably, the, in retrospect, it was the wrong choice. My first year at university was electrical engineering. Now, yeah. which is, it turns out the, the engineers at that stage were really homophobic, mm -hmm. transphobic, misogynist. Mm -hmm. And, I, and you know, I only lasted a year. I actually passed first year, but it was like, I can't cope with this culture. It's mm. just too macho, too homophobic, too misogynist yeah and I transferred to science but then my, I, was, I was in a real mess psychologically because I wasn't living my true of my course. true self yeah and, and I dropped out of uni yeah but when I was at first at uni I um, started doing things like um, you know spending I was doing time backstage doing mm. student theatre which I really love mm. and I just saw a job advertised for ABC TV and so I applied for it and I got it mm -hmm. I mean and so all of a sudden I found myself working in television yeah. and um, I remember my first day really dramatically. It was a big studio. It was the Kamal show. Probably, you know, um, old people will remember Kamal. He, he was a really a very popular singer in the 70s in, oh, a, right. in Australia. He, he was a, I think he was a Pakistani prince. Oh, who, oh prince. Yeah, yeah, oh. who, who had a really deep, resonant voice. Okay. And he, and he, and, and ABC, we had a show, so yeah. we had you know, we had guests and we had dancers and we had a, a live orchestra, like a 60-piece orchestra sit behind him. Yeah. So it was my first day. It was like, wow, I was just wide-eyed. Wow, I love being in television. Yeah. I mean, although when I think about it, <laughs> my first show this experience was before that, when I was an altar boy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so, you know, I love being on stage yeah, with the yeah. thereable yeah, and, yeah. you know, holding a cross or whatever. Yeah. Why did you continue um, working at ABC? A few reasons. Well, it was fun. Yeah. And, you know, we did rock and roll. How could you not like a job where you go to work and, and you put up lights for, you know, yeah. for rock and roll? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, I mean, it wasn't intellectually challenging. Uh, you know, although, uh, and I gradually became, got, got a few promotions and became boss of a crew. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, that was interesting in itself. You know, yeah. like at times I've been in charge of 30 or 40 people mm -hmm. just to coordinate them. Yeah. Um, and then... The most technical thing I did was, you know, I was a technical manager in outside broadcasts. Right. So that's when you take your five or six trucks to the football and, and you run cables, put up mm -mm, cameras. Mm -mm. And, you know, um, so probably the most complicated one I did was for the Commonwealth Games in 2006, right. where, where, you know, uh, we we're going live to air for two weeks, yeah, yeah, which yeah. was quite intense. <laughs> and when I had that bit of extra energy, I went back to university part-time, so mm. I finished my science degree with a major in genetics. The, I, the reason I did genetics is because I thought the biological sciences were key to understanding gender, yeah. um, which were, by the time I finished the degree, I realised they weren't. Yeah. But, but because you know, I, I was at that stage quite interested in what makes somebody a, a boy or a girl, yeah. particularly. But, but I was being too intellectual. Right. I was being a, a, at a... I was looking at it from a, a biological point of view, mm. you know. Um, and but but when I was there, I joined the uh, the the gay, the gay society, mm. and I, and I probably learnt more about gender in being in the gay society okay. than I did in my course. Yeah. Um, and then I went back to work because I'd sort of run out of money, because mm -hmm. uh, I would have liked to have done a higher degree at that stage, but mm. I, I couldn't afford it. And then just then I got a promotion, so I went, oh okay. And I realised I I could earn more money. Mm -hmm. um, in the ABC, in a sort of a leadership role, yeah. than I could um, 
as a base grade scientist. Many years later, I realised, because I was doing all that stuff through politics when I ran for parliament, yes. I realised that by telling my story, I, I, I was just making the world a bit calmer for trans people, a little mm -hmm. bit in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I had somebody recently who, who was the, one of the editors of one of the gay papers said, I think she said, to, I was really pleased she said this. She said, you changed like, like our perception of what trans is. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, wow, that was nice of her to say that. Yeah. And then my PhD supervisor, you know, Maria Pilota Chiaroli. Yes, <laughs> I know her, yeah. Oh, you know, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she kept inviting me to speak to her you know, her third years. Yeah. And then, then you know, very foolishly one day, maybe not foolishly, <laughs> I said, well, do you think I, I could take this further? Like, I, and do a master's degree yeah. because what I was finding, I was I, talking to 200 students, mm -mm. they understood me, and, mm -mm. And, I, and I think I was helping demythologize trans for yeah. them. Yeah. And then, um, and she said, Oh, no, 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 don't do a master's, do a PhD. I went, yeah. oh, Okay, that's a bit of a shock because <laughs> I realized how much work there was. Oh, of course. And, and um, I thought about it for a couple of months, and then, yeah, I should because, because what I, I think I've got something of value to, mm. to, to say about being trans. It's got a ridiculous title. Yeah. Yep. A feminist post transsexual order yes. ethnography on challenging normative gender coercion. And I said post transsexual as yeah. well because, you know, traditionally the transsexual disappears into society True. as their new gender. Yeah. And Sandy Stone said, well, no, you have to be, to be a political activist, you mm. have to be out. Yeah. So even though, you know, I, I pass reasonably well, I'm also out. Yeah. Uh, by being post-transsexual, what I'm saying is that uh, it's important to be out so you can have a political voice. It is true. I mean, like, uh, especially being an advocate as well, you know, a lot of people, like, they hide that identity, yeah, uh, which yeah. I do not understand. I understand why people do, because I've got, particularly trans friends my age, yeah. most of them are very secretive. Yeah. And, look, and some of them even haven't told their girlfriends or boyfriends. Yeah. And I, I went, wow, that's really risky. It is very risky, but I guess being an advocate, you need to be out. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. unfortunately, you have to. But I do, um, when I start bec um, becoming an advocate, maybe on like only about five years ago, I've met a few people yeah, yeah. Uh, in my work, and some of them do not expose themselves. Oh. And sometimes, even like even like doing speech, they have to cover their face, yeah, yeah. put a wig on just to um, disguise themselves, which I do not understand at that time. Like, why? I'll give you a little like, yeah. example from, from work. It was 1990 when I transitioned. Mm -hmm. So a few months after I transitioned, and remember, 1990 means what I'm trying to calculate. <laughs> that means I was 30 years, 32 years cuter than I am now. One of the guys at work looked me up and down and said, "You ought to have transsexual tattooed on your forehead, so blokes like me aren't tricked into being poofed." Oh my God! Okay. Um, and you know, unfortunately, a lot of guys who discover somebody a woman's trans, yeah, become violent towards them. It's true, isn't it? Like, as if, like, we want to sleep with them. Oh, well, occasionally you do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, yeah. Well, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they just approach you with, like, hello, you come to my space, and then you just yeah, uh, yeah. voice out your opinion, like, I don't need it. For me, at another level, it's funny because, look, if a straight man finds me attractive, yeah. he, he, you know, he, he might think I'm trying to trick him into being gay. Yeah. But if a gay man found me attractive, People will say I'm tricking him into being straight. Um, no, uh, and if a, lesbian, <laughs> if a lesbian finds me attractive, I'm tricking her into being straight. Yeah. If a straight woman finds me attractive, uh, uh, yeah. people will say I'm tricking her into being lesbian. Girl, we can't win. Only <laughs> those who can see me beyond gender yeah. can relate properly. This is properly. why um, um, when I moved to Australia, I just feel like I can be myself. Yeah, great. Like in Singapore, I have to hide my identity. Like I always have to be passable. I have to be female. Yeah. Um, you know, like over here, I can just tell a man like I'm a transgender woman. I'm yeah, very proud. Yeah. I think that's really great that that's happening now. But mm. you see, of my generation, yeah. most men of my generation, more the other way around. Oh, no it'll way. Be, it'll be 5% who think it's okay. 95% would say, you're, yeah. you're trick, trying to trick me into being a puffed up, that, like ah, that guy okay. said. It just reminded me of something. A friend of mine sent me a, a, a web thingy. Uh, uh, how uh, modern is that? <laughs> a web thingy. A web thingy. <laughs> a web thingy. I mean, yeah, that sh shows my age. <laughs> anyway, uh, that basically what, what it was, the states in the United States, mm. like for example, Texas, yeah. which has a lot of anti-trans laws now. Yes, it, correct. Apparently, though, that they looked at their internet usage. The Texas has a very high usage of trans porn. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so the, <laughs> the people who are most anti are often into trans porn, which, you know. But you know what? This is have proven a lot of them who are anti-trans, fancy trans. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We have discovered that we have experienced it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like those guys who make fun of us in the club. Yeah, the yeah. next, the next month or two, you will see them with a transgender woman, or maybe they slept with one of them. Oh, that's because we're so fabulous. Yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> trans fabulous. Exactly. Talking about trans fabulous, we have another book that I was in it as well as with you. I'm so honored to be in in oh, this no, book with great. you. Oh no, it was great. Great to meet this you anto- through this book. Yes, yeah, this yes. anthology that was edited by Sam Alkin, Alex Gallagher, Viz, um, and Babu. Let's talk about your inspiration in this um um uh this book. So I basically did a very sh- short bio. Yeah. Um, and talk and talked about some the same mm-hmm. things I we were talking mm-hmm. about already. The fact that you know. Yeah. I, could, I just thought my mum, mother was dumb mm. for thinking I was a boy. Um, but, but I also talked about the fact that, you know, like in the late 80s, I, I dated a lesbian feminist. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, that was a bit stressful yeah. uh, because, you know, she, she, was, um, she was politically against trans. Yeah. But, both, but, but bizarrely, the two of us... Okay, were, so she against trans, but she dated you. Yeah, oh. yeah. No, but she fancied me as well. Okay. <laughs> And I fancied her. Okay. So we had this really tense relationship uh, between be, between our politics, which was yeah, opposed opposed. Yeah. But our sexuality, which was very very attractive. And um, what happened after that? Did oh you... well, she, effectively we broke up when I okay. transitioned. Yeah. Okay. But but we had you know quite an interesting relationship prior to transition. Yeah. Okay. But right. but she 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 would never go out with me dressed as a girl. She only ever oh. go out with me dressed as a boy. And I guess I was a fairly good-looking boy at the time, yes. but, you know, <laughs> uh, but you know, but I couldn't see it. I just thought ugly, hairy girl. <laughs> when I read your um, um, your part, it's relatable. Um, you know, I, as a transgender woman, um, a lot of the stories as a transgender woman in there is so relatable. Oh, good. Yeah, That's especially good. when it comes to families, parents, mum. That's the whole thing, though. Mm. Um, unlike a lot of it, so if you're a gay man, for example, you can sometimes keep that very isolated yeah. and just be and only be gay amongst your gay friends yeah. because I'm in the gay and lesbian chorus yeah. at the moment yeah. um, and and over the years there's been a number of members who've never who've, who've been in the gay and lesbian chorus yeah. but they've never told their family yeah but the thing is when you're trans as soon as you walk out the door everybody knows yeah and so we, when you're trans you, you have to tell everybody everybody you relate to your family work your colleagues yeah you know people at school mm you have to tell everybody. It's true. A- and so, you know, it, it adds a much higher level of stress. It's like me when I um, enrolled myself into college in Singapore. It was a private college yep. because I, um, the public college do not uh, accept trans uh, women at that time in the late yep. 90s. So, um, and I had to change my name legally into a female name because I don't want people to be calling me by my boy's of course, name. Of course, yeah. yeah. I yeah. didn't think of that. I, I didn't thought. I, I didn't think that um, that was even legal that I can change my name. Oh, okay. So I had to hire a lawyer and then change my name legally. That was one of the first things I did, actually. <laughs> yeah. And so when I told my boss at work that I was transitioning, yeah. I just presented him with the form. Yeah. Which said legal change of name. Yeah. yeah. All right, Judy. Let's talk about this. Well, I, I am, I'm doing a show at the Butterfly Club in September. And this is about your life story or something? My, my PhD is about my life story. Okay. Right? But, you know, and I was really rapt to, to see that about 2,000 people downloaded my PhD. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm guessing a lot of people didn't read it end to end. Right. Think about a PhD. Most PhDs only get read by six people. But there's, there's about 130 pictures. And this is the thing about being you know, post-transsexual. I've yeah. shared photos from when I was a, you know, a boy. Yeah. Um, when I was very stressed yeah. in my late teens, um, and then and then the experiments about how to become, you know, Julie. So w- what my concept was was I'm going to turn my PhD into a cabaret. Yeah. So that you know, um, and make it entertaining. So this going to be comedy. Oh yeah, what well, it is? It's funny in part. Okay. So I'd like to take people on a bit of a, an emotional journey. So you know, mm-hmm. I talk about how, as a naive kid, I yeah. I, 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 my, my parents, I just thought my parents were dumb. Yeah. And then I got really, really depressed, depressed yeah. around puberty. Mm-mm. And then gradually I worked out ways to get rid of my facial hair, start to experiment with being me again. Yeah. And, and, and then the stress of transitioning um, and then telling everybody I knew. I can do that as autobiography. Yeah. But, but I thought, well, 
It's more One. fun to do it as a cabaret. I throw in a bit of really daggy singing. I like the three photos I picked. I like one, them. one is quite recent. Yeah. There's one of me as about an eight year old boy yeah. with the Virgin Mary giving me a hard time. Yeah. And the really glamorous one is from 1989. Yeah. That's before I transitioned. Yeah. So that was me experimenting with different ways of being a woman yeah. before I transitioned. So I've only ever looked at glamorous pre transition, or maybe, or maybe a couple of times. Was it um, hard for you to share that picture of you um, as a boy? Initially, but, but um, the first time I did it mm -hmm. was in 1998. So, you know, um, again, doing things gradually. So um, there, was a, there was a conference um, called the Health Indifference Conference, which mm -hmm. I think is still happening every two or three years. Mm. Um, and it was in Melbourne in 1998. And because um, they wanted trans representation, yeah. I was on the committee that, yeah. that set up, that, that helped um, set up the conference. Mm -mm. And... And we had a, a session on body image. We already had one paper on trans body image and another paper on lesbian body image. Right. And so the rest of the committee said, oh, we, we, need a, um, we need a trans person. And because it was so late, I went, oh, okay, I'll do it. Yeah, okay. And then I realised, because up until then, I'd kept all my boy photos locked away yeah. and all my girl photos you know, out. Yeah, and then I I put them together back in time, and I went, wow, this tells a really interesting story. Yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so, and I called that session. I dream, therefore I am. Thank you so much for uh, being you, being trans fabulous, and thank you for being here as well. And I'm looking forward to go to see your cabaret soon. Oh, great! Yeah, I look forward to it. Yeah, thank you. You've been uh, with me, Sasha Side, uh, at Trans Fabulous, and I'll see you at the next episode. Thank you.